Most supplements for osteoporosis do absolutely nothing, but these three actually strengthen your bones. Let me show you what they are, how they work, and how much you actually need. Here's what you can expect to learn. First, we'll bust two supplement myths. Then we'll discuss three reasons why I really like supplements. Then we'll discuss what those three supplements are for osteoporosis. Finally, if you're wondering, well, what about this other supplement or this one? I'll explain to you six reasons why ineffective and unproven ingredients are often included in bone supplements. Before we jump in, who am I? My name is Igor. I'm the author of the Amazon best-selling book, Osteoporosis Reversal Secrets. As well, I run an online personal training company that specializes in osteoporosis reversal. And just so you don't think I'm some random guy on the internet with an opinion, I'm a personal trainer who actually trains clients who have osteoporosis and I can see the results of the efforts on their bones. So here's one example. Here's Darlene, who was a jock up until the age of 46, when to her surprise, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. She went through a standard treatment of chemotherapy, radiation, and eventually estrogen blockers, and as expected, but not desired, her bone density went down until she was on the verge of osteoporosis. Her oncologist was threatening medications. She didn't want to go on medications. So we were able to strengthen her bones using some of what you learned here. Then here's Laura. Laura is a 68-year-old client who lives in Los Angeles, and she had severe osteoporosis, as well as a long family history of it. We were able to strengthen her bones by 4 to 7%, depending on the site. And lastly, here is Anne. In this picture, she's 60 years old, she was fit, she ate a vegan diet, and to her surprise, but not ours, developed osteoporosis. We were able to strengthen her bones in a very quick uh, manner, in about four or four months. She had great improvements beyond that. So now let's jump in. Here are two supplement myths. One, a giant myth is that supplements don't work. Now, to believe this myth would be to ignore a mountain of research showing that some supplements do work. That's not to say that every supplement works, but there are some supplements that work and some supplements that don't. In my experience, between 25 to 30% of supplements that are claimed to do something actually do it. But to say that 100% of supplements don't do anything, that is just factually incorrect. The second myth, is that you need to make dietary changes first before you can take supplements. Um, after all, the, the word is supplement. Therefore, it's an addition to an already healthy diet. That's what the rationale goes. Uh, but that's actually not true. And it's not true for reasons that we'll discuss in a second, which is why I really like supplements. One reason that I like supplements is speed. You can get faster results when you combine exercise plus nutrition plus supplementation than when you don't when you do that without supplements. The second reason why I like supplements is results. <laughs> uh, why take something if it's not going to lead to results with essentially very little effort? And the supplements that I discussed in this video have proven to show results with, again, with no changes in nutrition or supplementation. Uh, going back to our previous myth of you don't need to make dietary changes first in, or in order to benefit from supplements. After all, when supplements are studied, researchers directly tell the participants in that study, don't change anything else, just take this supplement. Because after all, if somebody in a study took a supplement and also changed their nutrition or started exercising or took medications, who knows why the bone density changed? We don't really know. That's why it's important to isolate variables and it, the research shows that supplements by themselves without that dietary changes work. Some of them do, the ones discussed in this video. Lastly, compliance. Um, that's the third reason why I really like supplements. And what do, what do I mean by that? If you have a history of 50, 60, 70 years or more of not exercising, not eating the right way for bone strength, etc., and then you have to change that to a way that is bone friendly, well, it's going to be difficult. Not impossible, and you should definitely try to do it, but it's going to be difficult. However, tell somebody just take a pill or take a powder, you're going to get near 100% compliance. And those are three reasons why I really like supplements. With that out of the way, what are these three supplements? In no particular order, one of the most powerful ones is collagen. And here's a study titled, Specific Collagen Peptides Improve Bone Mineral Density and Bone Markers in Postmenopausal Women. Here is what happened. Postmenopausal women uh, took type 1 collagen, and I want to emphasize that that's very important, and their bone density in one year improved 4.2% in the spine, in the hip it improved by 7.7%. .7%. Very powerful. 
Here is another study titled Specific Bioactive Collagen Peptides in Osteopenia and Osteoporosis. And here's what happened. In the spine, their bone density improved by between 5.79 and 8.16%. And at the hip, their bone density improved between 1.23 and 4.21%. Quite powerful. And again, I want to emphasize this is type 1 collagen. The brand you see here, I have no affiliation with it. It's not the one I use. It's just I couldn't find a generic picture to put in this PowerPoint. Um, but it's very important to use type 1 collagen for your bones. Type 2 and type 3 do other stuff. Not relevant to this presentation, but type 1 is the one you want to use for your bones. Um, and again, I don't talk about specific brands. I know somebody is going to ask me about this inevitably, but why don't I talk about specific, uh, specific brands? Two reasons. One, it's possible that by the time you're watching this video, that brand is out of business. Second of all, I have no idea where in the world you are. Are you in the US, UK, Canada, somewhere else? Uh, some brands that are available in some countries aren't available in other countries. And I don't, I'm not aware of every brand because they pop in and out all the time. Okay. Uh, so that's why I don't talk about specific brands. So how does collagen work? Here's a study titled Collagen Supplementation as a Complementary Therapy for the Prevention and Treatment of Osteoporosis and Osteoarthritis. There are two major mechanisms. One is that they, um, they work on cells called osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are cells that break down bone tissue and collagen decreases their activity. The other thing it does is it improves osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are cells that increase bone tissue. So at any given time, some amount of bone is being broken and some new amount of bone is being built. Generally speaking, as a person is growing, they're going through childhood and puberty and young adulthood, the osteoblasts outpace the osteoclasts. Eventually, somewhere between the ages of 25 to 40, they're even. Bone is not gained or lost. After about 44, especially for women, um, osteoblasts become less active and osteoclasts become more active. So collagen helps bring that back into balance and possibly even change that a little bit in, in favor of osteoblasts. So if you're wondering, how much type 1 collagen should I be taking? The minimum dose is 5 grams per day. It does come in a powder. So that is our first supplement. The second supplement that can really help with bones, especially in postmenopausal women, is soy isoflavones. Here's a study titled Soy Isoflavones for Osteoporosis. In a, in, in, a, in, a, in a period of time of six months to two years, bone density improved by 0.9 to 3.8%, depending on A, the duration. If, if it's six months, it would improve less. If it was two years, it improved more. And also the severity of osteoporosis. The more severe the osteoporosis, the greater the improvement. And lastly, the the site, it improved by different amounts at the wrist versus the lower back versus the hip versus femoral neck. So how do so isoflavones work? So isoflavones are actually chemically pretty similar to human estrogen, as you can see. And estrogen is largely responsible for healthy bones. And when estrogen declines during and after menopause, uh, that creates a little problem with, with the bones. And so what estrogen does, just like collagen, is it stimulates osteoblasts and inhibits osteoclasts. And uh, so as the flavones increase estrogen levels slightly, but enough to actually make a dent in terms of bone density. How much soy isoflavones do you need? A minimum of 75 milligrams per day. So if you're wondering, you're going to the health food store, you're looking at all these soy isoflavones, and one has a lowest dose that's above that, that's fine. Um, but if it's below that, it's not fine. Either look for a different product or take you know two or three, however many it takes to get up to the minimum of 75 milligrams per day. The third supplement that I'll talk about is vitamin K2. Here's a study titled Effect of Vitamin K on Bone Mineral Density. And in here included the WMD state stands for weighted mean difference in bone mineral density relative change was 1.27%. Not bad. Here's another study uh, or uh, meta-analysis rather titled Does Vitamin K2 Play a Role in the Prevention and Treatment of Osteoporosis for post menopausal Women? And the answer is... Yes, absolutely. Here is how much bone density improved in this meta-analysis. Between 1.40 and 3.98%. Okay, quite impressive. Now, here's another study, an actual study, not a meta-analysis, where 241 people with osteoporosis were divided into two groups. Group number one got vitamin K2. Group number two got a placebo. That means they thought they were getting K2, but they, were, they didn't really know. Uh, they actually essentially got nothing. And after two years, here is what happened. And here's what I like about this study a lot. They didn't just look at bone density, they looked at something much more important, fractures. In the placebo group, uh, they had 
more fractures, 64% more fractures than the vitamin K2 group. And the vitamin, uh, the vitamin K2 group had 50% fewer fractures at the wrist. Nothing else was different. In terms of medications, identical. Nutrition, identical. Exercise, identical. This was the only difference between the two groups. Now, there are two forms of vitamin K2. There are, there's MK4 and there is MK7, okay? The vast majority of the research is done only with MK4. At the current time, the majority of the research in, on MK7 is only done in rats. It's very trendy for supplements to combine both MK4 and MK7 in the same capsule, but it's really unnecessary. I'm not saying harmful, I'm just saying unnecessary. Maybe MK7 works as well, maybe it doesn't. We just don't know. At the present time, there is zero research in humans. So how does it work? There are a number of ways by which vitamin K can decrease the risk of fractures. One is it increases collagen in the bone, and we already know about collagen. Two is it increases the connections between collagen molecules in the bone. So not just bone density, which it does do that, but it's how well the bones are connected to each other or the bone molecules are connected to each other. That's called microarchitecture, okay? Also, just like the other two, just like collagen and soy and flavones, it increases the activity of osteoblasts it decreases the activity of osteoclasts. And if you're wondering how much should you be taking, you should be taking a minimum of 45 micrograms per day of MK4. So if you have a combined supplement of MK4 and MK7, it needs to be above 45 micrograms. Now, we just talked about collagen, soy flavors, and vitamin K. I am sure somebody here is wondering, what about calcium? Well, according to extensive research, calcium actually doesn't work. Here is a very large study from the National Institutes of Health itself. The highlighted section says, the results showed that calcium supplementation alone had no effect on risk of hip fracture. What about milk? Well, here is one paper titled, A Meta-Analysis of Milk Intake and Fracture Risk, Low Utility for Case Finding. The results were basically, whether people drank milk or they drank no milk, made no difference whatsoever to the number of fractures. If this is completely blowing your mind and you're like, well, I've always been told that calcium for strong bones. I have an entire video dedicated to exactly this. It's about calcium for osteoporosis and it covers things like how much calcium do you really need? Is it 1200 milligrams per day or is it a different number? Also, why doesn't calcium decrease fracture risk even though it slightly improves bone density? So check that video out on your screen right now or in the description below. If you're also wondering, what about vitamin D, zinc, magnesium and others? I'll actually discuss that in my next video. So if you want to be notified when that comes out, uh, click like and subscribe to this channel. Now let's talk about why ineffective and unproven ingredients are often added to supplements. In no particular order, one, there's research showing that certain ingredients improve the bone density of osteoporotic mice and rats. But in science, you can only generalize the population studied. If you have a pet rat that has osteoporosis and a study shows that magnesium works, well, give that to your pet rat. <laughs> Otherwise, it might not work in people. The other thing we need to differentiate is between the effects um, of the short-term versus long-term effects. Just because it improves markers of bone metabolism in the short term, in a matter of hours to weeks, doesn't mean it's going to work for, uh, for bone density in a matter of one to two years, or more importantly, fracture risk in more time than that. So we have to distinguish because sometimes the short term doesn't translate to the long term. It's possible, but if it wasn't studied, it's unknown. Reason number three is that there are a plausible bone gain mechanism, but there's no direct data on bone density or fractures. This is similar to the previous one where there's a, a possibility that you could see how it might improve bone density, but the actual end point of bone density and more importantly, fractures reduction was not studied. And four, sometimes it only improves bone turnover markers in petri dishes, but humans are much more complex than petri dishes or individual cells. So that has to be accounted for. Another one is the amount matters. Maybe the dosage used in studies is so much higher than those you can actually put inside supplements. And so you can't carry over from one to the other. And finally, maybe an actual ingredient really, really does work. However, what if the change in bonus is so low as to not make a difference. And that is the case for a bunch of supplements. Maybe it improves bonus by 0.5%. That is such a low improvement that when it comes to fracture risk, it hasn't changed at all. So it's not a binary, yes, it improves bone density, or no, it doesn't improve bone density. It's more a question of by how much does it improve bone density, or more importantly, by how much does it reduce fracture risk. 
I talk about all this and more in a special video that I've created for the viewers of this video. It's titled The Stronger Bones Checklist, Six Steps to Improve Bonesity Naturally. This video is not available on YouTube, but you can download it for free by visiting this link on your screen right now or in the description below.